So please welcome Christina Mand Lacchioni to the show. Welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to see you again. Oh, so, um, well, you know, it's like I've been in personal development for, you know, I'm older than you, but, you know, since in my twenties, right. I've always been that kind of person. So mind Valley has always been part of that, um, in my head. Right. So when I, um, had knew I had the pleasure to interview you, it was almost like I was interviewing a celebrity or someone that I looked up to a mentor, a guru, you know, all those things that, you know, just someone that I through, through my life for the last 20 years, probably mind Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I've, I've gotten to, um, so sitting here with you and I know we sat when I, you interviewed me months ago, so I got to meet you then, but, um, seeing what someone does in their life and where, where their childhood, you know, we both are parents and have raised these children and mine are a little bit older than yours. Mine are 14 and 17, but I'm listening to you and, you know, you've just now are this book. Becoming Flossom is coming out right now. And I know it's been this like baby to you that you've been trying ready to birth. And <laughs> I admire, it's like, I, I look and see, and I've been learning about you because I love learning about um, people before I bring them on of just, you know, what it takes to write a book, first of all, but what it takes to get to the place where you actually know what you're going to write when you're going to, you always <laughs> like you have a dream. I want to write a book one day. But then yeah. it really comes real and you have the, <laughs> the title and you create those chapters. And what am I going to, what's my point and why am I writing that? What, what is my, what is my why? And so mm-hmm. I would love for you to start with, I need to understand why, like why this book, why, um, flossom, why, um, you know, like thinking of your, um, like marrying, you know, your marriage and all that stuff. I would love for you to explain kind of how you were raised too in Russia. And mm. yeah, I would just learn something neat about you too, was you were in Russia. They do the Olympics. They train the kids when they're like four or five years old yeah, for gymnasts. Right. And that, that's really interesting anyway. So, so, I, so I'll try to, I'll try to give, uh, g- give answers, but not probably in very chronological order because then yeah, I would good. start with Soviet Union. I will say that from the beginning, I, uh, I never lived in Russia. I lived in Soviet Union and I know that for the okay. outside world, it's the same, but I've lived in Estonian, I mean, in the part of the Soviet Union, which is Estonia, which, 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 uh, it, well, for, for us from, from this, <laughs> from this point of view, it's an important distinction, but right. I do speak Russian and I, I, did, I was brought up in the Soviet system. So so I, I get it now uh, when it comes to the book uh, you you I think because you've been in person growth for such a long time you probably also have that feeling that you know when everybody around you has been writing books or written a book and, and half of the p- people that you know are best-selling authors you kind of take it for granted you never even question am I going to write the book you just know you will write a book sooner or later it's like you know if you're born to a family of entrepreneurs you know that you'll grow up right. to be in business um, and, um, and I think that that has always been a thought in the back of my mind. And I absolutely, uh, agree with you that the biggest question that I had was, so what do I have to say? Because right. that's, that's probably the scariest question. There are so many books out there. And especially if you take the whole history of humankind, uh, I, I feel that somehow book is such a serious format that people normally, uh, normally are stumbling behind this idea. What am I going to say? What do I have to say? So in my case, I, I was ready to write the book uh, when my message had matured. It's like with babies, like uh, when you're pregnant with a baby, you kind of, you know, that you're pregnant, but you don't feel it in the beginning, but then when the baby's ready, you can't keep it and you have to deliver it. So right. that, that was the point because uh, being in business for such a long time, I heard that phrase over and over again, you should write a book, it's good for your business. Uh, it's it's part of a business model, write a book, write a book, write a book. But I'm partially very uh, obstinate and partially pathologically honest. So for me, that wasn't an argument enough. And I had to, I had to, I had to feel that it's it's that baby that I can't hold inside, and it's ready to be birthed. And that's that's the point when I wrote the book. Now, uh, I wrote it a little bit reverse to uh, w- how they are written in personal growth, but uh, I, 
I know that it's it's quite a common technique. I wrote a book and then uh, and then an intro and then the title came. <laughs> so oh, the title oh, really? was the last yeah, thing cool. to come. Yeah, I only cool. knew in, in, in vague lines that I was going to write the book about how to find your path back to you because that was the question. So I started writing a book with the question in my mind, how did I get lost? What happened? Why did I get lost? How do I find myself back? And then as I wrote the book, uh, when when it was finished, then I understood what it was about. It might come a little bit from my background. In um, I, I was um, an artist as a, as a child. I actually went to an art school, and I know that it's with art. It's sometimes so strange. You kind of you you create something, and then you know we had these uh, appraisals every year. So we would hang all our art through the year on the wall, and then all those teachers, the commission of teachers, would walk by and look at your art, and then they will say what they think. And it was the funnest thing because they would look at at things that I just I just created, and they would say, "Oh, and here she felt like this, and she wanted to say this," and I was like, "Yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to say." But you're hmm. not you you don't you don't uh, put it into words when you are in the process of creating it. So the same with the book, it was the easiest part of the whole journey because I'm a writer by nature. And for me, that was just the form of self-expression. So I had a question in my mind and I sat down and I just wrote. And then later when it was all finished, that's when I started to find the meaning in that and give it a title and give it an intro and, and, uh, and, I think it took another half a year for me to understand that my book was about self-love. Right. Yeah. So I listened to you speak and I'm getting this is your why for this book is you were lost. You were, you were trying to be someone you weren't. I'm just guessing. I'm just going by what I'm getting and why the self-love, like doing things that weren't in, in alignment with your true self. I mean, I'm tr- so w- what brought you to that place? Why do you feel like you were lost? Where show me that of trail. The, the path uh, to hell is, uh, is laid, uh, or, or, <laughs> God, I'm butchering the most famous quote out there. The path <laughs> to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, <laughs> I did, uh, I was going for uh, success and trying to be a good girl. I did all the right things. And I wouldn't say that I was, you know how we are lost. It's not like uh, we're lost because we're going um, in the opposite direction. We're usually lost because we are we can't find the the path between three trees in the forest. So I was somewhere near the path, but just not quite. So uh, my being lost wasn't that I did everything wrong, but somehow the things that I did didn't feel right. Now I do very similar things right now but they don't feel the same way anymore. So uh, I have been in this industry for 20 years and I started as an entrepreneur and a marketer. I'm still in the industry. I'm still in the company. I'm just doing a different thing. I suddenly realized that in fact, I'm a writer. And, you know, part of what I did before had to do with writing. I was really good at writing emails. (laughs) <laughs> I enjoy doing that. It was genuine yeah. communication and I, I was pretty good at that. So the element of uh, of what I'm doing right now was there. It's just that I was focusing on somewhat wrong things. I was focusing on conversions. You know, can I write a really converting emails? And I did some spectacular numbers because, you know, perfectionists, ambitious people, we, of course, we're good at whatever we apply ourselves to. Uh, and you can, th- that, that's the scary thing. You can do a very, a thing which is very similar to what you're men- meant to do. You can do it really well. You can really achieve high success and still feel, uh, you know, like a fraud or un- unfulfilled. Hmm. And that's that's what I called lost. And again, when I started writing the book, I didn't really know that. So it, it was triggered with this um, experience that I had. I, I was traveling and I came home, uh, came back to, to the office after a few months of traveling. And a friend of mine said, I missed you. And I blurted out without thinking, I missed me too. Hmm. And then when I blurted it out, it, it, it just was such a shocking experience to me because I, I, I stood there and I was thinking, did I just say I missed me too? What I mean, and that's that's somehow um, it it happened at, at forty, and then of course I, I I didn't sit down to write a book immediately, but that that was the same question that I was trying to answer when I sat down to write the book a few years afterwards. Right. So you were married to your husband. You co-founded Mind Valley. Were you during this trail of, that's leading you to now? 
do you, we were in the moment? Did you not feel the authentic you? Is that, or were you just like going through the motions? Were you raised like with the perfection and you're just going to try to be this best person, regardless of anything that, you know, I'm going to find the perfect husband and we're going to get married. <laughs> we're going to find this business. We're going to create this together. I think I had a good husband. <laughs> I don't know if he was perfect, but I don't know if anybody is perfect for that matter. You know, that's the uh, that's the interesting thing. It's not that I felt inauthentic. I don't think any one of us feels inauthentic if we ask. Uh, and and that's the the funny uh, funny thing because uh, in the nature of delusion is that we are never aware of it. Because the moment we become aware of delusion, it stops being delusion. So, uh, and uh, being authentic is being true to yourself. So the opposite of it is actually being delusional, or being lost, or being, uh, mm. you know, being in the fog. Uh, so how I found out that something was wrong was not really that I felt inauthentic. Um, and I guess I guess nobody likes to feel inauthentic. It was when. Uh, when I, I when I judge myself for what I was feeling, or I judge myself as wrong in something. So a very simple example is my own life. At the age of 40, I thought that I had made it. And a lot of people said that uh, they found me inspirational. I had a husband, two children, business, the work that I enjoyed, traveled the world, you know, that perfect facade, which is so pleasant to show on Instagram. Right. And, uh, and with all of that, I felt discontent and sometimes I felt like crying and sometimes I didn't even know why I felt like that or frustrated or angry or lashing out at people or grumpy and and which would have been half the problem. The real problem was that I really felt ashamed for not feeling happy. I was feeling uh, not even ashamed, but guilty. How dare you not feel happy? Don't you have everything that other people dream of? So what's wrong with you? And that was which kind of triggered me on this path of trying to find out what's going on. Why do I feel this way? Of course, now that I've realized that I had forgotten at that time uh, what it meant to be true to myself, I guess. Now, now I can see that that those um, the, that, that the problem was that I actually denied myself my, uh, my true experience. I denied myself the right to be what I am, to feel what I am to ask myself, why am I feeling this way? To actually sit with myself and with this discomfort. So, but that's that's probably a, a different conversation. It's it's now going down the rabbit hole. But right now I can say that that cognitive dissonance is in essence the red flag that you are probably forgetting who you are. Right. So when you were realizing that moment, did you you were sitting there question. It's like, I always say, you got to ask yourself these questions. I mean, that, it's, it's really about the questions you ask yourself, I think in life. And were you asking like in a marriage? I mean, it's, that's a big deal to say, I want a divorce, but, you know, you have two children, you know, in your heart, like I'm just not being this. What are you saying to yourself during this time when you really make that decision? Well, um, I, I don't normally go uh, uh, very deep into this uh, experience because um, I don't think I've given it enough time to to uh, to understand. Uh, and yes, it was a scary decision, and it's a little easier, for example, for me to say that uh, I divorced from my <laughs> business partner years before that, and it was a painful separation, or I you know, took a sabbatical from work because uh, my my work that I enjoyed and that I was good at uh, felt wrong to me. And yes, at some point I did feel unhappy in the marriage, uh, and it was scary to admit, uh, because why would I? I have a good husband, and we have good relationships, and, and uh, you know, am I, am I planning to find someone else? Uh, we are both uh, we are both single right now, years down the road. So it wasn't about a better option. It was about, you know, that separation was purely the relationship between me and him, and had nothing else involved in that in that decision. So 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 it it is about being true to to what you feel. Now it doesn't mean that I never regret what I do. <laughs> Or that I don't don't wonder if I should have uh, taken a different decision, but I'm not afraid of mistakes. Right, it's okay. 
what I'm afraid of is betraying my feelings, is shaming myself for what I am, for what I feel. That's, that was something which was unbearable. I just couldn't bear to try to be something which I'm not. That was right. just exhausting. Right. You know, it just hits me because I, you know, raising kids and, you know, having the, you know, growing up in my childhood and looking back, you made me reflect on my life and who gave, who was, um, you know, what are you going to be? What, what do you like? You know, what are you going to do in college? Are you going to grab all the things that are these questions that, you know, are just thrown at you, especially, you know, when my older daughter's going to graduate from high school next year, and those are happening now. And it's, you know, does, when you, there was something in what I read, do, do your dreams really belong to you? Does your life belong to you? And when you're raising the family and I've heard, like, I'm, I'm, as a mom, I'm like, I need to like, you know, I'm always about like, um, what do you love and things that interest you? And then when they do find something that interests you, like, you know, what would that look like? You know, trying to let them make their own path, but with you, like, what, what does that mean to you? Like, cause you feel like, you know, do your dreams belong to you? Like we're all these people influencing you to become something. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> I'm, I know I'm just uh, wondering. <laughs> it's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> I, sorry. I, I tend to giggle sometimes. Oh, um, no, it's good. It's, um, I, they do belong to me, but even the previous dreams belong to me. It wasn't that somebody insisted that I have to choose the path that I uh, walked uh, it was my choice and uh, and that's uh, that's the unpleasant thing that we we say that we are on this path and I'm lost and I'm on this path because somebody had forced me to do that my family expected me you know why do I stay in a career that I don't like oh because I have uh, obligations I have to pay the the loan and uh, you know I, I have to be responsible I have a family so we, we always have that story around why we make the choices that we make or why we stay in the choices that we have made uh, before. But I do insist that for most of us, uh, we have, it, it is our choice. It's not forced on us. We just, you know, the, the society can expect anything they want from us that, that becomes our own boundary and our own uh, cage the moment we subscribe to that. And yes, I am absolutely aware that not every society is free. And I have lived 16 years in uh, Malaysia, uh, which is a pretty conservative society, Asian society. I've lived in uh, uh, Soviet Union for 14 years, like not even comparable. It's like North Korea, uh, if you want to have any, wow. <laughs> any analogy. So I understand. But, uh, you know, if you've read uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, most famous book, um, Man's Search, yeah, for, Search meaning. for Meaning, yeah. he's he is writing about people who were in concentrate, Nazi concentration camps. And one of the messages that he has there is that even in those circumstances, you still have a choice, right. which is scary to understand, but it is true. Mm -hmm. We still have a choice. We always have a choice. And very often when we say that somebody expects something from us, it's still our choice because we chose to, to go down that path and to subscribe to that expectation. Because whether we like it or not, but most of the world don't care, doesn't care what, what we do with our lives. They will right. have an opinion, but that doesn't mean they care or right. that they will force you. Yes, uh, if you are a woman in Iran, probably this, uh, the, you know, the, the government will force you to wear a headscarf. I get it. But sometimes we, we get lost behind, uh, behind the... Um, you know, be, be, be behind the circumstances of, of what it is. Yes, you might be forced to kneel down, but you can still choose to leave your dignity intact or to stay true to yourself or not to lie, or not to betray, even okay. if you are in an uh, enslaved position. And now, of course, we, we have to come back to, to, uh, um, to the realities of most of the people who probably watch or listen to that. We live in affluent democratic countries. We have more, even more choices, many more choices. So do my dreams belong to me? They've always belonged to me. It's just that I've become a little bit more selective what I, what I choose for myself. And the other thing is that because they belong to me doesn't mean that I have to marry them once and for all. 
I right. can make a mistake and I can change. And that's yeah. fine too. Exactly. I think what comes to me right now is identity and realizing, I, I, I think I'm thinking of you, like I'm a, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business, business owner, I'm a speaker, I'm an author, all these labels that we wake up to every morning and have to fill. Right. And then what, like, what if one of those labels, what if I take one away, what will that do? What is yours take on that? Like identity. I sometimes feel like you get stuck on your, your decisions or your, um, the choices that you do make because you have this rigid identity instead of like, taking those bricks down and, and putting them away and waking up and saying, who am I? Like, what do mm-hmm. I get to do today? Maybe we'll do something all new, you know, but what do you, what would you say on that? So I, I like the, um, in the, in social psychology, there's the theory, no, sorry, in psychology, there's a theory of social roles, which I think it, uh, explains it very, very beautifully. We, we play different social roles, which is natural uh, because, you know, we're not just robots who do one function. Right. Uh, and, and of course we, um, we, we adjust our behaviors and our expressions depending on social roles. A very simple example is if you come from a holiday with your girlfriends, the way you uh, tell about it to your children and to your husband and to your other girlfriends who are not on the holiday would be very different because we have to adjust uh, our expression to the circumstances. This is uh, natural. This is healthy. Not doing that is actually a psychological disorder. So uh so what, what that means is that uh, our expression of ourselves changes depending on where we are in uh, throughout the day or in our life, uh, in our social circumstances. Now, sometimes those social roles can be at odds with each other. And that is when the problems start brewing. For example, if you are a mother and an entrepreneur, uh, and sometimes you have to prioritize one social role over the other, for example, if you have to work like right now, my kids are going to sleep and an entrepreneur in me or an author in me took priority. So rather than singing my daughter to sleep like she usually likes to do, I'm sitting here and doing an interview. So uh, so what we do normally when our social uh, roles are at odds is that we naturally tend to prioritize the social role, which is more valued by society. Which is why very often would naturally prioritize being in, uh, an entrepreneur over being a par- parent. For men, it's particularly pronounced, actually. For women, right. it's a little more complicated. Or uh, if you're a woman leader, these our expressions as a woman and our expressions as a leader, the way society sees us is very contradictory. Uh, very often when you're being feminine, and, and I'm talking in stereotypes right now, society doesn't think these are good qualities of a leader. So because leaders are more valued by society, I'm really sad to say that than women. Mm -hmm. Very often women, um, women have to suppress their feminine expressions to be considered good leaders. So this is what happens to us when our social roles are at odds. And we have to choose one uh, over the other. Now, the true problem starts brewing when, uh, when we, when we, when, when uh, you know, when the role that we de- deprioritized is uh, is creating that um, feeling of guilt or shame, mm-hmm. or if we, uh, if we, if we are so, we feel so bad about that role that we start suppressing it completely. Or if we are so enamored with a social role which is highly valued that we are um, dismissing other social roles. So those conflicts in themselves, they are natural, but our reaction to those conflicts is where the problem happens. So uh, let's say if I start feeling guilty about uh, deprioritizing myself as a mother, I'm I'm tempted to start, you know, um, criticizing myself, uh, digging deeper, uh, adding uh, more, you know, when, when when you feel guilty about something uh, and, and you, you start criticizing yourself for that, you kind of add uh, another stab at a wound, which is already right. there, mm-hmm. rather than reconciling yourself to what had happened or finding the ways not to be in that situation again. 
or finding finding some kind of solution to that or if you if you are so enamored with your role as a uh, as an influencer and a celebrity that you sometimes start dismissing your friends mm -hmm. or you are a boss and you have to fire your friend you know all those social roles when they get into conflict that's that's when the true problem uh, starts brewing and and here here is the place where we need to remember uh, what our values are and who we are because yeah. that's that's the way out right you know I was listening to um, you talk about that we've been talking about perfectionism but that's always on the other side of perfectionism is the fear of failure and I you know I loved you know when I think of that and I think of I also think of um, my role of what I do in my life you know thinking of being a mom and all the things that we were just talking about having this podcast, you know, trying to be perfect and not, and I'm, I'm, I think the older I get, the more I, um, and have pushed past the fear and realize it doesn't matter if you have to be perfect, but for me to be a mom and trying to teach that to my daughters, like you don't, have, it's all just take that, you know, take, go through that fear, just do it. And then there's that magic, but we explain, cause you talk about perfectionism a lot in this, in your new book and how, um, and I love the fact that, you know, when you see an evolution of somebody and you're reading this, you know, like watching, it's like, almost like you can, um, you take a deep breath and you're like, Oh, she's, you know, we don't need to be perfect. <laughs> we, we love ourselves. And I'm always about, all about self-love too. And I, I, that's part of it too. I mean, it all, I think you're right. The whole thing about everything that we're talking about comes to self-love. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of it. love everything. And I, I want to say a scary thing about perfectionism. We uh, very often perfectionism is just an aspiration and it is not attainable. And that's the, that's the, um, scary thing about being so attached to that aspiration or to be obsessed with perfectionism because you you don't realize one very simple thing people can see through your mask or through your uh, facade mm -hmm. so while you think that you're putting up the, uh, the the picture of perfection in reality everybody knows your quirks and your flaws and your dragons are there oh, yeah. the dragons yes but but and and that's why perfectionists are not very uh, popular people. It's usually when they, uh, they when when they show the real right. the real humanness when when people like think of Hermione because in my book I, I call it Hermione syndrome. But if you've seen, uh, of course, because I have children, I've seen all the Harry Potter movies. Harry Potter, very, right? In the very in the very beginning of uh, of uh, well, it's not just movies. The books is the same story. In the very beginning, Hermione comes across as this snotty, annoying person, and and uh, her then later her best friends initially they don't like her. It's when she shows some signs of humanity when when you warm up to her and you start liking her as a character. Right. But who loves the picture of perfection? And right. it does does it even exist? It's not natural. Perfection is just not natural. It's not in the essence of nature. Nature is all about irregularity. It's about mm -hmm. some kind of, you know, making a step away from perfection. That's how the evolution happened when things mutated and were not normal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's the being authentic and vulnerable. And those words are a lot. Um, you speak about those words a lot too. And you were referencing a quote from Brene Brown, because she always talks about vulnerability and it, it may, it, you know, it's like being vulnerable to me, like, you know, being authentic, those words, there's like, so we're, those are words we hear a lot today are those, you know, be authentic. I mean, social media, just being like, you watch, you can scroll down and see the perfection. <laughs> like, do you really stay on that? Or, I mean, I like to tell the girls, like, you know, when you're, what you're putting yourself out there, you know, what are you portraying? Like, be real. Like, they just want to see love in your eyes. They just want to feel that connection. But, you know, when they, when you live in this world of social media and the perfection, now be vulnerable, now be authentic, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
It's um, it's a lot of pressure on us to be a certain way, and uh, it might be tempting to uh, to think that after after I made this rant against perfectionism, that people still know that you're real, even if you don't show it. Uh, you might expect me to say that you actually have to be vulnerable. Well, probably to a degree, yes. Uh, you have to be vulnerable if you need to, if you want to create. Um, strong human connections. And that's exactly what Brene Brown is saying, that vulnerability is a necessary uh, component for you to create those strong human connections. And human connections are absolutely necessary for you to be happy. So it is a very valuable skill. But uh, do I insist that you have to be vulnerable? I don't think so. It depends on uh, you know your, your level of comfort. And different people have uh, different um, circumstances where they become vulnerable. I mean, uh, I, I think it's a valuable skill. Do I think everybody needs to do that? That's a choice. I don't even think everybody needs to do personal growth and transformation. I right. think it would be good if people learn to love themselves. But not everybody probably is there. Not everybody probably is, is, is ready for that. So there is, there is definitely this tendency in our industry to force people into a certain path. And to uh, we, we do have that uh, illusion that I know best what's good for somebody else. And if I know that this is good, I'm going to force it on you because that's for your own good. And that's what we do with authenticity and vulnerability. We sometimes force it down, down other people's throats when they're not ready. Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, we tell them how to be vulnerable or how to be authentic. When How, how, how do we even know that? Authenticity exactly. is, you know, if you look into anthropology and that's the only scientific explanation of authenticity is to be true to yourself. It's only about you and yourself. Who else knows what it means to be authentic for you? Nobody does. And I've heard, I've, I've been asked that, you know, since I talk about authenticity, people sometimes talk, turn to me as, as an authority and tell me, tell that person they need to be authentic. How do I know? Maybe that's, that's what it means, authentic for them. Right. Yeah. I, you know, it's like you said something um, like you can't fix anybody, you know, you, you can't come out in this, in a relationship, let's say for an example, and fix your partner. It's not, that's not what we're here to do. We're here oh, to, this is, but this is so delicious, isn't it? To try to fix people around us. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something, you better change. <laughs> no, I mean, I thank God that I've figured that out in my life, but you know, that's a lot of pressure. True. And uh, I, I mean, um, and it's not just a lot of pressure. It's also uh, unfair mm -hmm. uh, because we take upon ourselves uh, the role of judging what is good for someone else without knowing all the whole story. Even if it's, even if it's someone that we love and we know really well, of course, with children, it's a little bit more complicated because there is responsibility that we have for the children until they're, uh, you know, full, full aged and can take their own responsibilities. But that exception aside, I, I actually, I really doubt that I even, I mean, my parents, for example, are smoking and I, I really dislike that habit that they have. And I know it's bad for their health. Right. But I've also battled for years trying to fix it and it's not working. So I guess they're having a journey that I just can't understand. And I guess my right. my fate is to to witness that journey and love them nevertheless, whether right. they're ready to do as I think is good for them or not. Right. Yeah, it's their journey. That's how I always say that. It's all it's your journey, not you know, I I I don't judge. And I think um when you realize that you know, everyone's on this planet at this time to learn their own lessons in their own way. And to, I mean, the only thing that I could say by an example is show how much you love yourself, <laughs> be that beacon of love that you, you exude the love. I mean, it's, it's a, after re listening and reading to you, reading your book, um, you know, you're, you even have a program. If you buy the book, you have a 10 day self-love program self -love, yeah yeah and that, i that offer is not up anymore by the way but oh, the program but I, is there <laughs> yeah but i just you know i was looking at it and looking at the you know 10 day topics and you know i always ask my clients when's the last time you said you loved yourself and i i mean i would probably it's just like a blank stare or when you know you talk about self care versus self love we just we um give that yeah, description 
you know it's um uh so so the very easy um analogy would be that when a child is born the child requires care and i i say sometimes maintenance <laughs> as in <laughs> Feed the child, you need to dress the child, wash the child, walk the child, entertain the child, soothe the child, you know, all those things that the child needs to uh, to, to grow and thrive. Not thrive so much, but grow at least and, and, and be healthy. Now, we all know that if uh, if that child's parents are too busy for, uh, for, for the child um, and they are not present there at work, they don't have time for the child, usually the child would grow up uh, wounded in some way. We, we understand that for a child to grow up into a healthy, happy human being, they need love and connection. We all know that. It's something, it's something intuitive that we feel. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the difference between self-love and self-care. Self-care is a maintenance program. It's how you take care uh, of, of the child. Self-love is a relationship. And relationship is not tangible. And that's why it's so hard to understand because self-care is by nature ritualistic. Yes, you can care about your well, emotional well-being and your mind, but it is there are rituals which make sure that you are fine. It's like walking the child, soothing the child, but the true love is non-ritualistic. It's, mm -hmm. it's something which is so intangible, but we understand what it is. It's the connection. It's the commitment. It's being present. It's being compassionate. There's no ritual behind it. It's it's always there. It's like the, you know, it's like the uh, the the soundtrack to your life, and that's and that's the difference between the two. The self care is necessary for you to survive. Like as I say, I charge if if you have a picture, I charge this phone, this device, because if I don't charge it, it will die. But I don't charge it out of love. Right. Love is connection. It's uh, it's it's that thing that that uh, sustains you, that makes you actually that that helps you thrive. So because because it's uh, not tangible sometimes and uh, a little bit hard to explain, it's it's tempting to uh, to focus on self care, thinking that you know I'll I'll take care of myself. That means that I love myself. But that causality goes goes only one way. Yes, if you love yourself, most likely you are going to take care of yourself. But the fact that you take care of yourself does not mean that you love yourself. Right. And that's, and that's not a pleasant pill to swallow. Very often, uh, we, you know, very often because I don't understand how to be there present for myself, I'll go and I'll do another self-care ritual because this is something that I understand. But how can I give myself love when I failed? when I'm blushing, when I feel worse than uh, worthy. This is so hard to understand. So I'd rather do a ritual which I understand. That's why we very often, um, we, we often replace uh, the, the, the self-love with self-care because self-care is just, just uh, easier to grasp. And, you know, it's, it's, also, it's also an explanation. If you, if you look into the core of how it happens, it's also the explanation why we are so set on going for success and, and working hard because working hard is something which we understand. We don't understand the stroke of genius, which requires some kind of miraculous things to happen. We don't understand how to uh, be successful while being happy or doing something what you love because we think, it's you know it's it's this uh, inexplicable phenomenon so because we don't like inexplicable phenomenon we do things which we know how to do and what we humans know very well how to do is how to put more hours or more effort or more time into something right and we very often replace something so deep and profound with just being this little hamster in the hamster's wheel just running harder running harder Mm -hmm. And um, this problem is actually much deeper than uh, I, I dare to touch upon it in my book, because uh, because sometimes the very good intentions become the slippery slope that take us further away from from uh, from what we need. Right. Oh, so true. I, that whole thing you just said, it just spoke to me. It's when you explain and I'm just going to say it and because your words are so beautifully expressed. Um, but when I, what I got from that, um, Christina was 
the self-care, like meditate and, you know, get up every morning and do your thing. And then one day I don't, and then it's like, oh gosh, I'm terrible. Or I get, get go to my Pilates class. I missed those two days. Oh, you know, it's like these, and it was so, it's, it was a wake up call to me thinking, gosh, that's not, that's, self, that's just self-care. It has nothing. It's like self-love. Like, you know, I, you, people equate that to their work there. Yeah. Right. Is that yeah. a good way of explaining it, it? It is a good way. And you know, there is another undercurrent. Uh, first of all, the way we punish ourselves for failing our self-care is sometimes so out of proportion. And I've seen people who actually, uh, they, they, they have their self-care rituals, uh, so lined up and, and perfected that if they make a step aside, it's actually it's actually the the damage is so big to 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 their well being. It's like you know my, my my doctor once said, you know that glass of wine that you have makes uh, makes less damage to your body than the stress that you're feeling about having it. Right. I heard you say uh, that. I was like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Because be, be, and, and we're forgetting that now, uh, that is something which we see on the surface. There's another thing which is a little bit under the surface is that sometimes we are so stuck on those rituals that we start forgetting their essence. Like one of the most uh, commonly uh, praised um, practices in personal growth is uh, gratitude, which uh, if practiced, uh, it's, it's proved to increase your well-being and you know your your levels of happiness and 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 um, things like that. Sorry, I just saw a bug on the floor and I got a little scared. That's why I got distracted. <laughs> but it's all fine. So, <laughs> but uh, but what I've also noticed that uh, people who practice gratitude for a really long time it becomes ritualistic. It becomes mm -hmm. like ticking the boxes, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, and you, but the the point of uh, of practicing gratitude is first in feeling that feeling that emotion of gratitude for a moment because it's such a positive, uplifting emotion. So when you're actually grateful, think of think of for example if you've been sick and you uh, became better and you came outside and you took that first breath of fresh air knowing that you're well again, mm -hmm. how it feels. This is the gratitude. This is the emotion. And when right. you're sitting in your meditation and taking off the boxes, it's like comparing, I don't know, sorry, I'll bring the, up the wine analogy again, the, the <laughs> aroma of wine with just plain water, which I know water is healthy, but, but still, it's such a huge difference. And the other thing is, of course, uh, you know, focusing your attention on things which matter and away from things which may be uh, uh, destructive to you. Uh, analogy for that would be, you know, when a year ago a war started on our border, um, I live in Estonia, I fe we felt scared because uh, the president of our neighboring country insisted on, on uh, talking about nuclear weapons. And I had just moved back to Estonia from Malaysia and I felt so scared for mm. my children. I felt so scared that it was, it was painful because I was worried that what if the next morning, what if this night will not end peacefully mm -hmm. until one moment I realized that there is no guarantee about tomorrow. And the only, the only thing that I can feel is the present moment. That's when you refocus your attention from things which actually distract to you to things that matter that in this present moment, I have me and my children and the blue sky and the peace and can't I enjoy this moment, even, especially that I know that this is so fragile. Mm -hmm. So this is the essence of the practice of gratitude. Very often when we do it, we, become, we start doing it on autopilot and it becomes this motion, this ritual, this, this thing that we do without even putting the, the true essence into that experience. And it stops bringing results. And what happens over time is that you are stuck. You're in the dead end. You think I have all my life is sorted out. I do all the right things. I do all the right practices. Why am I not feeling what I'm supposed to feel? So true. Because very often behind the notion, emotions, we forget the essence. Right. You know, we, I, I practice gratitude with the girls their whole entire life. We have gratitude journals and they, you know, it's like a library when they were little, even before they could write, they would draw stick figures. And, um, 
but I, I knew how important that was, especially with children being grateful instead of just the just taker, right? Like a, not being a giver and a, and a gratitude having that, but you know, it's like we wake up and it is the feeling like, what was that feeling from yesterday? What was your gratitude moment or switching it up and not becoming a robot? Like you're saying, but you gave me more, um, like more depth to that because it's so true. It becomes this ritual and, you know, we could, you know, we're since, you know, they, one of them drives to school now, but you know, their whole life, we would get in the car and we would do our affirmations and, you know, they'd be the same ones. And I said, no, we need to switch it up. It's like, we're just a recording, a robot that has no meaning, you know, the ritual is a ritual. Yeah. We're doing it, but you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's, I love that. And we're also, there was another part of, um, what I was reading was the positivity. Like when you were, you talk about positivity and, you know, I always, you know, me and my, um, teachings, you know, like I'm so alert to words that are negative and I'm mm-hmm. always trying to like, you know, replace, you know, let's think of what the words you speak, the thoughts you think, you know, so take me, take me down that path. <laughs> It's, uh, I think that it has its roots in NLP and I, to, to some degree, actually, I subscribe to that as well, but that's, uh, the, but the, um, there are nuances. We always have to see the essence of things and then I think it becomes a little bit easier to navigate this whole thing. Uh, if you have certain uh, patterns uh, which can have destructive uh, influence in your life, then it's good to replace the negativity with positivity. For example, I don't like the idea of sacrifice and hard work for success. I think it's a really, it's a really horrible, um, <clears throat> it's a really horrible um, set of beliefs. I prefer to replace hard work with determination or passion, mm. right? Or, or staying uh, committed to something. So this is this this has the element of that NLP, you know, choose what you want to believe in. So there is there is space for that. Yet uh, yet we sometimes go so far in that direction that we uh, prohibit or taboo or or, uh, or kind of demonize. Uh, everything which is uh, which is not with a plus sign, which is not positive, and again, uh, positive and negative is is a is a, uh, is a subjective thing or subjective uh, in a way uh, approach to that. Uh, Susan David, uh, she's she's a TED speaker and uh, and a psychologist. She has this wonderful idea. She says, "Don't judge your emotions as positive or negative," and I would say uh, also thoughts and war and and events. They mm-hmm. just objectively, they just are right. And your circumstances. The moment we start giving them plus or minus, you know, positive, negative, good, bad, there's judgment to that. We don't want bad. We want good. So say shame or fear or anger. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it bad? So um, it's, it actually, it just is. There are cases where anger is good. I was once, um, I, I was once, I had a really close friend who, who I suspect, and it's not my medical diagnosis, had a very strong case of narcissism and, and, and was very manipulative. I was suffering and I felt guilty because she, she, she was that type of, you know, vulnerable narcissist who actually was massively loved by everyone. And I felt guilty. Uh, and uh, but, but uh, for for not enjoying being with her, she was my close friend. For not being able to figure it out, and uh, a year passed, and a whole lot of uh, the, uh, the process of me trying to understand what had happened. At, until one day, I was very angry with her, and it felt like liberation. Oh. Huh. And in that moment, anger was actually liberating, and uh, and uh, it, it lifted me out of my deep dark hole. Right. Or fear. When I go on stage and I don't feel fear, I usually don't perform very well. For me, it, it's it's that emotion that puts me in in the mm-hmm. right state. So uh, it's it's really tempting. But but these these examples are probably a little bit uh, easier. Pain of losing someone dear to you. It is a painful emotion. Is it bad? Is it negative? Or is it just? your natural expression and something to remind you that you had something so meaningful in your life. Right. And maybe a reminder to, to value what meaning you still have left in your life. 
So the problem is not uh, per se in the idea of replacing pain with pleasure or so-called negativity with positivity, but in, in doing just that and not seeing the, the different circumstances. So if it's your pattern, of course, replace it because patterns probably damage your life. But if it is an experience you are having right now, then please, for God's sake, don't because you're going to deprive yourself of a human experience, which probably can be enriching, illuminating, transforming, helping you get to know yourself better. Right. Oh, you, you know, just the way I know you're just a natural writer and it flows through you and your words and your, I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, you're definitely doing what you're, you're, per, you're doing your purpose. But we, when you're talking about, we're, we're coming to the end, but I want to ask you about emotions because I've been talking about emotions lately. And, you know, when you, you were explaining something and I'm drawing a blank on what it was, but you were just, it's just, I think the mastery of your emotions or like mastering them, is that yeah, ring about? It's, yeah, it's, um. I, so, so it's interesting, my book is, uh, is um, divided into two parts. And then the first half of the book, I actually try to share the skills that you will need for the second half of the book, which is a right. deep dive. <laughs> and I think that uh, the, the one skill that is absolutely fundamental for any kind of transformation is awareness. That's from which I start. And then the other skill, which I think we are missing, and it's important not just for transformation, but for life in general, is is being able to deal with your emotions. I call it emotional literacy or emotional ABC, depending on <laughs> depending on the audience. <laughs> but basically, right. it's understanding how to how to um, handle your emotions or how to process them, because this is something which is part of human experience. We we have emotions for a reason, and unfortunately, from very early age, we're indoctrinated to judge them and to uh, suppress certain emotions and to be okay with other emotions and not to not to go too far into a third type of emotions. It's really restrictive. We are told from very early age. Don't yell, don't be angry, don't be sad, don't cry. When we grow up, we also told, we're told, how, how, wh why are you sad? First, first world problems. Oh, think of the people who have less than you. You're blessed. Be grateful. <laughs> I am right. deliberately actually using somewhat, yeah. <laughs> somewhat painful words. But we are told how we are not supposed to feel. We are told how we are supposed to feel. And actually, even how we are supposed to feel. Oh, feel blissful, feel love, feel joy, but not too much because otherwise it's euphoria and don't chase happiness. Right. So it's, it's really interesting that we keep being told how not to feel and the very, very little slither which we are allowed to feel. And, but the, the reality of life is that we have the whole range of emotions and they all come for a reason. So in my book, I, uh, I compare our emotional, um, emotional expression with the way our body uh, has sensations, physical sensations. So our body has physical sensations because that's our body's language to, to draw our attention to certain parts of our body. Let's take pain because pain is the one which we have biggest problems with. When you touch a hot surface, you feel burning sensation because you need to remove your hand from the hot surface. If you cut your finger, you feel the sensation because you need to pay attention and maybe dress the wound so that it heals. Our body feels physical pain because that draws our attention to those parts of our body which require our attention and healing and, and maybe some kind of fixing in some way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And uh, people who are born without the ability to feel pain don't survive to adulthood because their bodies just break and they die. So our emotions and emotional pain specifically are given to us for the same reason. When you feel discomfort, when you feel pain, it's, I do not know, your emotional body's way to draw your attention to those parts of your life, which require your attention and healing. So when you feel angry, yes, maybe it's not a savior emotion, but it's also a signal for you to slow down and ask yourself, what is going on? What is this feeling telling me about my values, about my essence, about my wants, my needs, my life? 
And the one huge mistake that a lot of us are making is that we, we are afraid of certain emotions. We suppress them because we think that being true to your emotion means being erratic, being angry, being, you know, uh, being all those things that, which is not okay to be. And we are forgetting that there is a space between you feeling an emotion and you making a decision and the next step, or you can make that space, you can create that space. You can feel angry and choose to still act with compassion or be just. You can feel sad or upset or annoyed and choose to be, you know, civil, to be, uh, you know, not to be a nuisance to people if you don't want to be. So you, we, all, we, we, we are allowed to feel all of our emotions and we still have a choice to act out of our values rather out of what we are feeling now if we suppress our emotions very often what happens and i talk about that in my book at length is that you know emotions they don't disappear like if you if you if your head is hurting and you uh, pop paracetamol or sorry in in us it's something else maybe perfect <laughs> painkiller yes. yes if your head is hurting and you pop painkillers whatever causes your headache is not going to go away. You're just not going to notice it. Right. The same with emotions. Just because you suppress them, you ignore them, you try to replace them, you, you shove them away, they're not going to disappear. They're going to stay and they're going to probably uh, increase in intensity. And sooner or later in psychology, there's such a thing as emotional leakage or you know, when the emotions uh, leak out when you least <laughs> need them to leak out, passive aggressive beha behavior is a very right. example of emotional leakage, or they explode when you least expect them. You were asking me about my uh, divorce. I was feeling discontent in my marriage for years, but I didn't dare to face that dragon. By the time when I had to face it, it was, it was so painful. I couldn't, I couldn't handle that anymore and it ended up in separation maybe if i had faced it earlier i wouldn't have you know it, the the decision mm. or the solution wouldn't have been so explosive right that's a good example that we can all relate to oh christina thank you for your beautiful book that you are are going to be able to share with the world um, what would be a piece of advice that you're, you would give to your younger self? Before oh, I I wouldn't. That's what I want to know. Tell me nothing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give because if I, if I haven't, I mean, of course, I, sometimes I wish I ran away from certain people, but I, if I haven't had my, uh, my bumps and my scratches, I wouldn't have been here. Yes. Maybe I would have been in a better place. I do not know, but I'm here and I'm thankful for that journey. Right. Yeah. I love that. What about with your children as like, as being a mom, what is your main like intention with, with that as they grow? I want them to, uh, to be at peace with how they are. Of course, I also want them to become better in certain skills, <laughs> 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 but I really, and, and sometimes I am nagging also with certain discipline questions, but, uh, but fundamentally, I'd like them to uh, to feel to feel at peace with however they express themselves, and know that I'm going to love them, and I'm there for them. Yes, I love that. So we can find you, Christina Mand, on all the yeah. social media. My, my handles are Christina Mand, and because I'm from Estonia, it's with a K. <laughs> okay, Christina with a K. Yeah, right. And then um, your book on Amazon and it's out now, right? It's out now. It's on Amazon. It's in, uh, uh, in the bookshops. It's even in the airports. So it's everywhere. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see it. We're going to Italy in a couple of days. So I'll be at the airport. I'll oh, look for it. Good. Yes. That's, that's really um, good. What a good feeling for you to walk by an airport and look in there and say, it's your book. I bet. What a feeling, I huh? I have to, I have to fly for two years for that. I'm still in Europe, but uh, I'm going to do that for my book tour. And uh, I, we have a book, my book in, in the shop in Estonia. That's been pleasant. I've been oh. making little trips there and, <laughs> and <laughs> looking at my book there. Oh, I love it. Oh, what, the, what a good feeling. Oh, so proud of you. And Thanks. it's so nice to meet you. 
and Thank have you. fun on your book tour. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much.